I think I'll then start with just a very, very warm welcome. My name is Ann Carney, and on behalf of the Aphasia Access Resource Exchange Committee, I am very excited to welcome you to this special series of Brag and Steals. In honor of Aphasia Awareness Month, we are having a two-part Brag and Steal featuring the experts, uh, people living with aphasia. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you'll come back on June 27th at the same time for part two of our series. Just so you're aware, our format today is a little bit different, um, as we'll hear from all of our presenters first, and then we're going to end with a question and answer panel. So we'll also end a bit later than 4 p.m. Eastern time, but we'll end by 4.15 p.m. So now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Kayla Foraker from Brooks Rehabilitation Center in Jacksonville, Florida, to introduce our very inspiring presenters. Thank you, Anne. Hi, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Research Exchange Committee, we're so excited to have some of our friends with aphasia here today. We had so many submit that we actually have to do two brag and steals, but we are so excited to hear from each and every one of you. Let's go ahead and let's start this off with a man that I'm sure many of us know, Dr. Tom Brizard, who will present on, and he'll have to explain more about this, fish can't see water and hospitals can't see aphasia. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. This is Tom Broussard. Hopefully, I know sometimes these things break stuff in the way, get rid of all this stuff. Take your time. Uh, my name is Tom Broussard. Um, yes, fish can't see water and hospitals can't see aphasia. Uh, what I'm talking about is um, aphasia awareness around the country, as we have had various surveys before about how many people in the country have or know about aphasia. Um, it turns out to be very, very few. And a few years ago, I started going to hospitals around the country to see if they have any information about aphasia. Uh, because I've heard from an awful lot of my friends, people with aphasia, who told me that they didn't know about aphasia and didn't know for years that they had aphasia. So we started doing a survey of the about, as you see here, almost 2,500 stroke-centered hospitals in the country. Um, and to date, we are we have recorded or surveyed 418 um, hospitals so far, and you get to see how they're broken out uh, with primarily the the uh, comprehensive and primary stroke centers. That's where most of them are, and they are the ones that have most uh, skills to work with people with stroke and aphasia. Um, the, but as we started doing this survey uh, of the 818, 418 so far, you get to see what isn't happening at um, hospitals. Sadly, I say that sadly, um, most, 92% uh, of the hospitals do not provide any information about aphasia or very, very little. Uh, so in our survey, when we say no information, that means no information. There's not even the word aphasia showing up there. Even if they are stroke-centered, even if they have a, have a communication office, um, no information. The one mention um, is literally just one mention of uh, of of rehab of one kind or another, and it might make make use the word aphasia, but no explanation about aphasia, no help with what this means, and certainly no links. Uh, the one that's called little information, again, they might have a rehab uh, office, um, but they won't have any links to anywhere else. They might even have a little bit of information about aphasia, uh, problems with communication and so on, but still no links to anything at all. Um, we have done, uh, as you see on the right side, the green side, there are several hospitals that do provide some amount of information. And we did give uh, an award this year to one of those hospitals um, who, who uh, does a fair amount of information about aphasia. Um, as you see here, what we really need the hospitals to do is provide uh, distinct pages about aphasia, you know, explanations about it, because unfortunately, there's, har there's hardly any inf uh, information about the explanations about that. We have to provide materials about aphasia 
either at the hospital or at discharge for the same reason when you are discharged and you don't receive any information about aphasia and now you've gone home waiting until you finally get to a rehab uh, opportunity, uh, an appointment, it take, could take months for you to go there. So between the time you left the hospital and now you go to rehab, you might not, you probably don't have anything about aphasia other than what your family can look at online. So you need to provide materials uh, uh, at the hospital. You have to educate people about the staff. Um, many, all of the staff know what aphasia is. But if you start to ask what that really means, they will tell you, yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, my recent doctor said, yeah, it's this language thing, right? Tell me about what that is. That's my PCP. So you have to educate the staff. And of course, at the other end, you have to code, collect, and use the information about aphasia. Um, the stroke-centered uh, hospitals um, that I've talked with, they have told me, yeah, they have some codes, but they typically don't use it. So that is all a big, big issue when it comes to aphasia awareness going forward. So we did provide this uh, proclamation, this award to uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital and the Aphasia Clinic in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they do a fair amount of information and believe it or not, they are one of the only three of the 418 hospitals that actually have a link to the National Aphasia Association. Three of 418 and they are one of them. So we need to do an awful lot more on the front end of all of this, because otherwise those 30 to 40% of people who are discharged with stroke and aphasia, they'll go home knowing they have stroke, not knowing they have aphasia. So that is what we do at Aphasia Nation. Thank you very much for today's presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I think you're right. I think it is a continual battle to do better and to advocate. And hopefully with all of our voices together, we can continue and make that a reality. Yep. Um, so after Mr. Dr. Tom Brazard, thank you so much. Next, we have another doctor, Dr. Bora Keskin, and he will be doing a presentation called What to Do. Bora, I'll let you take it away. Hi, my name is Bora Keskin. I am a stroke survivor. I have aphasia. In October of 2016, at the age of 42, I was a director of a million dollar real estate company in Dubai. I was cycling at the gym and when my world came crashing down. I have a massive stroke. I have two beautiful children, Dunya and Poraz, and my wonderful spouse, Jamie. I knew I have to do whatever it took to get my life back. What to do? It is, it is, this has become my mantra throughout recovery. When I was frustrated, what to do? When I can find the word, what to do? When something positive happens, what to do? It is my way of accepting a present moment, no matter what. I would like to share 10 things I learned what to do to support and enhance my journey of recovery. I hope it would be helpful for others who suddenly have aphasia. Number one, lean on family or friends. Ask for help when you need it. Let them help you. Use your networks of support. Number two, join a community in person on online. A aphasia recovery connection, aphasia access, American Strokes Foundation, many other things. Number three, sleep as much as you can. Sleep is so important for your brains. Sleep 10 plus hours 
per night when you can. Whenever necessary. Number four, embrace therapy. Use your therapy resources available to you. Speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, anything. Number five, move your body. Walk or run, a yoga, stretch your body, anything to get your blood flowing. Eat well, of course. Number six, spend time with nature. Hike in the woods, walk in the grass, sit outdoors. Number seven, a connect with the world every day. Use your brain. If you don't use it, you will lose it. Email message, text often with people. Read books, read out loud if you can. Number eight, Retailize resources. Use application on the phone or a tablet. Uh, listen to audiobooks or podcasts. Find brain games and exercise to do daily. Number nine, relax. Find a way stay calm. Take a deep breath, meditate. Number 10, emotional self-care. Be patient with yourself, family, or friends. Stay optimistic. Have for, for the future, perseverance, persistence, and patience are key. Practice, practice, practice. Do it every day, every hour, every moment you can. Your brain is a muscle and neuroplasticity is possible. Most importantly, embrace a new normal. Focus on finding gratitude in your life now. I promise it will transform your life. You deserve to live again. What to do? Stay hopeful and grateful for your life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Keskin. That was amazing. I think all of us here could use that same advice, what to do, stay hopeful and grateful for everything. Um, I'm so excited because I already have questions and I know we have to get to the end. So we're gonna keep going along um, and we'll come back and hear from all of our presenters. So next up we have um, Ryan Dreyer and he his presentation will be aphasia to me. And we're going to do this a little bit different. So we do have some of these presentations pre-recorded. So bear with us and we're going to get it going. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Tim, I, I can't. For all professionals is about aphasia. My name is Ryan Dreher and I have aphasia. My healthcare professionals include doctors, social workers, healthcare therapists, and occupational therapists, and psychological speech therapists. I have two speech therapists, one is in an hospital and one private. All what I want. All of what I want to know that aphasia is a symptom of me, not all of me. My doctors talk to me and it, in most of the time I understand but I understand I don't. 
I like when doctors ask me if I understand. When doctors write things down, they help me understand what they are saying. When people, they draw pictures that also help me understand. I speak swell and sometimes I make a mistake. I want them to fix the mistakes, but not always. Sometimes I want them to wait for the war. I can change it. I, I would like people to wait for a minute. If something problematic, then they fix the mistake. The, this is advice for a healthcare professional. Oh, so good. Oh, absolutely amazing. And Ryan, we see you there in the audience. Wonderful, fabulous job. Wonderful advice. We can't wait to hear more from you um, and all of our other presenters, but just such a good moving perform a good presentation. Thank you so much. Wow. Let's keep going. Next up, we have Miss Marina, Sasha, and Tracy. Right. And they'll be talking about a young girl, a stroke in the family, and the importance of person-centered therapy. So I'll let you guys take it away. All right, thank you. All right, go ahead. Hi, my name is... Marina. And how old are you? I'm 12. And what happened to you two years ago? I had a stroke. It was an ABM. It was an ABM, yeah. yeah. And uh, you couldn't talk at first, right? Yeah. Could you talk at all? No. No. And you had some speech therapists who told us some interesting things, yeah. huh? Let's look for that. The first speech therapist said what? Meaning what? Okay. Don't work on speech. Yeah. Forget about it. What did one other one tell you? Right to you. Normal expectations. Mm. And what did uh, many speech therapists tell us to do? Point to pictures. Point to pictures. About what? I felt. How you felt? Yeah. Do we all know how you feel? Yeah. yeah. And. You know, alternative communication is absolutely wonderful and a lifesaver to many people. Who It helps them get what they want. Were you already telling us what you want? Yeah. You were, right? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have trouble understanding you no. at all. And you didn't want to use it, did you? No. So the speech therapist, when we told them, mm, it's not working for us, the pictures, what did they say? Bye. They didn't want to work with us anymore. <laughs> All right, and how did that make us feel? Angry. Angry, <laughs> very angry. And I, I'm a speech therapist, yeah. and I thought I was going cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> and then, here we are reading, who wrote all these books? The uh, famous children's author, right? Yeah. And we were reading these books, yeah. and one day I discovered this book. Not many people heard about it. It was about his what? My yes, and who, and who was she? A famous movie. Star. And what happened to her? She had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And the doctors told them, forget about acting, lower your expectations, sound familiar, right? Yeah. Did Raul Dahl do that? No. no. So he wrote this book, which was the mm. first blueprint mm. of something we'll get to in a minute. So when I read that book, I was thinking, oh boy, we need to find a new team of speech therapists. Yeah. 
where who is the expert oh, yeah. you are and we wanted somebody to be our partner right yeah and not follow a formula yeah to listen to you and all of that just kind of congealed into one big idea ask marina what she wants then work backwards work backwards and we found tracy who's sitting right next to us and i can't see this Ooh, that's okay we'll do this way. yeah so sorry guys so raul dal he wrote the very first blueprint for person-centered therapy not many people know that marina who is the most important person in person-centered ther the therapy i am yes you are and you couldn't communicate I mean, you, you could communicate well, you couldn't yeah. talk back then. You know. But you very well communicated to Tracy. What? I want. Um, that was very important to yeah. right? you, I else? want to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I want to do my hobbies. Your hobbies again. Mm -hmm. And I want to do my bar mitzvah. You want to get your bar mitzvah, right? Yeah. Because you're almost 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you want to get back to doing? I think I do my big brother. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I think I want. Or ordering whatever you want. So in comes Tracy. And Tracy, if you can explain Hi. what you did. So Marina let me know the things that she wanted to work on, which we went over in the last slide and then we worked as an interdisciplinary team so that means that everybody on marina's team is working together and communicating with each other and since communication was hard for marina i took on the role to help coordinate the care so over here we have her teachers and her speech therapist at school her occupational therapist as well and then a couple of other speech therapists one that worked with vital stim and kinesio tape to help with her speaking and then another speech therapist who is a voice specialist um, and worked on coordinating care to make sure that all of Marina's needs were clear and communicated to them and that everybody was on the same page, keeping Marina at the center of what we were doing. Yeah. All her goals mm -hmm. for the drivers. Mm -hmm. So did it work? Yeah, it sure did. Let's tell everybody how well this worked. <laughs> What are you doing in this picture? I'm going to treating. Trick or treating. And you told Tracy what was really hard for you? Talking and talking. At the same time. So yeah. Tracy, what did you guys do? So we changed what we were doing in therapy and put that as our focus. We started walking as part of speech and talking, making sure to practice so that when she was trick or treating with her friends, she could have conversations with them. Yeah. They covered miles of the neighborhood <laughs> doing speech therapy. What are you doing here, sweetie? A presentation at school. Yep. So you're not just going to school, you're very involved yeah. in school. What are you doing here? My hobby. By yourself or with friends? With friends. Chit chatting with friends. Yeah. Yep. <gasps> what are you doing here? I'm doing my big brother. With just your actions or with words as well? With words as well. And I love this because Tracy has been lately working on the fast processing, the, the zingers. Come on, come back with a comeback, come back with a comeback. Fast processing, working memory. And you guys, it's working. Yeah. Because <laughs> Adam's getting annoyed, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh gosh, what are you what are what are you eating there? McDonald's. Mm hmm Are you ordering what you want? Yeah. Who's that little girl in the yeah, that's Tracy's daughter. And where are you guys? Had a cupcake place. Did you? Who ordered the cupcakes? I did. For who? Me and Stella. For everybody. See? Yeah. So there was speech therapy around the neighborhood and at a cupcake place. And finally, what are you doing here? I'm studying Mama. Mama. Yes. And who is the lady you're studying with? Allison. She was in the other slide. She's the voice speech therapist who happens to be at our temple, who <laughs> singing is really good for aphasia. So they're taking Marina's gold, but mitzvah, working on voice that way. And of course we have the aphasia recovery connection and Bora mentioned it in his presentation. It's the most wonderful community. How often do we go to their meetups? Every single week? Yeah. Every single week. And 
it's just wonderful. It's new friends. It's we laugh together. We practice yeah. talking. Here are the B, all your BFFs, yeah. new friends. Um, and let's see if I can do this, share the sound. Um, let's see. I might not be able to share the sound, but hmm. hold on a sec. Hold on. Almost done. Share sound. Here we go. I will leave you with this. Hi, Marina. Hi, Karen. So you come to open chat because we like to practice and meet new friends. And you have a lot of cheerleaders here, don't you? Shall we see how many cheerleaders you have that have been cheering you on? Okay, so here we go. Let's see how many people. Whoa! <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, so, so good, Marina. Thank you so much to you and Sasha and Tracy for sharing your story. It's truly inspiring. And I kind of had to shut my video off for a second because I could feel the tears oh. of just, oh, so good. And I think it was really cool to show that and remind us that therapy doesn't have to be in a room. No. And the best therapy, I give this advice, the best therapy is the therapy where you're having fun and you're enjoying your life and you're doing the things that you want to do. Yes. Totally agree. And also annoying my brother is also high on my list. <laughs> <laughs> How's a grown adult? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Let's see who we have up next. Next, we have... Mr. Gary Delgado and Chelsea Miller with the presentation, What They Don't Tell Us About Aphasia. And that will be another pre recorded. Thank you. My name is Gary Delgado. I'm a black man who has been with aphasia. For about five years, I began to look at what was happening to people of color who have aphasia. We have not only the problem that we that we can't talk, we can't talk, but we also have depression. And when you have the two things, you have both black and depression, you put those things to together it's really, really difficult for people to, to be work around aphasia. So one of the things I'm curious about mm -hmm. is why do we not get to see black people? There are a lot of people who have got this, mm -hmm. but we're not in any places that help us. So what do you think about that? I know. I I don't know because you know you and me is the only black people is here. <laughs> you know, yeah. The, the therapists are mostly white people, and whereas. Some of the people are very nice. It would be much better to uh, have people who were black and Latinos and native and Asian. We don't have to wait. We need a peer group of, of people so that we can solve our problems ourselves. Hi, I'm Ellen Bernstein Ellis, and I am the Director Emeritus at the Aphasia Treatment Program at Cal State East Bay. The power of groups is that people aren't alone. They have people that they connect with, that validate their experience, that help them problem solve and work through the challenges that they might be experiencing or feeling, and it can really be a 
significant contributor to helping to rebuild a positive identity um, and to live fully as someone with aphasia. The launch of the aphasia treatment program was based on an intensive model that included community conversation groups. Seeing people in aphasia groups was magical because people were having those types of interactions and connections and opportunities to, to talk at the conversational level. You have to promote the leadership and the empowerment of the group members and elevate that. So the clinician wasn't the person in charge leading it. The clinician was coaching the person with aphasia. How do you help your partner? You can pick up when other ones have a little bit of trouble and and then I feel in when he does struggle with certain words. To me, that is very important to and that the people also because you feel comfortable about talking with others who understand your situation. Did you work with other people who were on aphasia? Did you work with people to work together? Yes, yes, yes. Every, every Monday and Wednesday, writing, reading, and then help me to read. Oh man, little in the time you, I did it. it, and then I was able to book. I know that you also sing. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes, and piano too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can work with each other so that we can live our lives. Thanks for thinking about this, and let's hope if we can do this together. Speakers in order of appearance. Gary Delgado, Larry Bird, Ellen Bernstein Ellis, and Carmen Preston. Additional input from Kim Flores, Ronlin Gu, and Drew Sperling. Coordination by Chelsea Miller. Video production by Channing Kennedy. Research by Gary Delgado, gdelgadox at gmail.com. Backstory narratives. Thank you so much, Gary and Chelsea. Um, I think that in a world where you can be isolated and lonely, having aphasia definitely does not help that. But I'm so happy that there are some groups around, but I do agree. I think we've got to keep making these groups, getting communities together. There's some, but there's not enough. So thank you for sharing. And we look forward to hearing more from you during our Q&A. All right, next up, we have Mr. Drew Sperling, who Hello. will talk about how music has helped with your aphasia recovery. Of course. So take it away. Thank you. Um, a long story short, I, I was going to the University of Oregon and on November 25th, 2009, when I was 21, I had a massive stroke due to a burst aneurysm in my brain. As a result of a stroke, I got global aphasia. I joined the aphasia treatment program at Cal State East Bay in 2000, uh, 2013. I have come a long way since my stroke, thanks to my family's support and the many programs I've had. To, and the thing is, I'm not done. Before my stroke, I used to sing, I, sorry, I, I joined uh, singing and performing in musicals and in choir. When I joined the aphasia treatment program later, I thought, I am not going to do this at all. But I thought I was only wanted to do individual therapy. Uh, but all of, all of a sudden, on Wednesday at 2 p.m., I discovered the aphasia tones and I was so hooked. Uh, 
and uh, the aphasia tones made me feel like my normal self. In fact, after joining the aphasia tones, I begin to uh, taking singing lessons again, and I also join a community choir. But I want to point one more one obvious. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, but I want to point out one more thing. If I hadn't, uh, if I had hadn't agreed to join uh, an aphasia choir, I could. I sorry, I would have missed out on all of the opportunities uh, I've had thanks to the other groups in the aphasia treatment program. I've also noticed other, other, <clears throat> sorry, other people in the aphasia tones feel good about themselves. Um, it helps with their uh, conversations. Conf sorry, confidence. For an example, one member, member was very shy and quiet, but all of and all of a sudden, she uh, get, get, she's uh, more confidence singing our songs from Greece or Mamma Mia, and she danced like no other, and sang really loud, and she's really f had fun. Uh, the second, a friend of mine, uh, could couldn't talk at all but he joined aphasia tones and he made and he smiled every single time he may not have uh, been singing but he uh he he joined jo joined having fun and being a uh, part of a community also also singing in choir boost morale some uh, people can sing very well and others really can't sing, uh, but that's okay. People, uh, people's uh, voices are soft or loud, but we're all doing this together. We are all enjoying singing. Honestly, choir is for everyone. I uh, would definitely recommended an aphasia choir for any anyone with aphasia it's it's literally fun for all of us who have aphasia apraxia or dysarthria it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that they're uh, what your singing uh, skills are everyone is welcome honestly let's have fun Thank you so much. Awesome job. Thank you so much, Drew. Music is such a healing power for anyone. Um, and, you know, using music for our recovery helps in more ways than one. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we are up to our wonderful last presenter last but most definitely not least we have judy crane with stroke smart education and that will also be pre-recorded so we will play that for you shortly and then after we play we will bring all of our presenters back and we will have the opportunity for question and answer thank you My name is Judy Crane and I'm a stroke survivor. And I work as a peer mentor at the Scale Aphasia Program, which is a part of the League for People with Disabilities in Baltimore, Maryland. While I am speaking, you will see the, the video training that we created. Our Speak Out Aphasia class spreads aphasia awareness in the community. Our governor signed a proclamation 
declaring Maryland a stroke smart state with the primary goal of encouraging everyone to learn the signs of a stroke and what to do to save lives. We did our research and decided we wanted to be stroke smart champions. Who would present stroke smart better than actual stroke survivors? The class members' commitment and participation was critical at every step, planning, creating scripts, PowerPoint, reviewing materials. We created a roadmap and made a proclamation to be the first stroke smart aphasia center. We studied the stroke, the Maryland stroke smart. We learned about statistics, types of strokes, stroke signs, treatment, quick response site saves lives. Someone suffers a stroke every 40 seconds. Someone dies every four minutes from a stroke. Next. Two million brain cells die every minute in a stroke. We added the online stroke smart slide presentation. We added our own personal stories to really get the point across. We, we practiced our script in class and out of class. I have a experience that is one of the most things that we talk about with, with stroke. When I had my stroke, I had difficulty speaking. I had difficulty understanding what people are saying to me. And I was feeling dizzy. I was very, very um, argumentative with my daughter and my husband. And I refused that I would allow them to call 911. I demanded that I be taken by my daughter in the car. So my own story, I started out with experience of arm weakness. I started to walk from my house and went to drive myself to the hospital. I had my insurance card, my credit card, my license, my phone. When I tried to drive myself to the car, my finger slipped and the car door was open. The stranger noticed me and he called 911. We delivered our first presentation to SCALE staff and volunteers. We got great feedback from the sur our, our survey and modified our presentation. We created a video of the presentation. This is a class that is virtual, so we did have some challenges. We presented the video at the main campus of the League. Members of our team were there for questions. Then we made the information aphasia friendly for the members of scale. We added pictures, underlined important words, and less words overall. In May, stroke month, and June, aphasia month, we are educating local stroke support groups and senior centers. Over the summer, we will educate the wider community. Everyone needs to be an ambassador hand out the Be Fast wallet card and save life-saving information. We are proud to be stroke smart champions. People with aphasia can be advocates and educate the, com the community. Wow. Thank you so much for all of you for sharing your story. I agree. I sometimes, I even get guilty of this. I think about the money of things and you're right. 
no amount of money is worth your life. Um, it's a way to make a difference in your community and to share to other hospitals. That's such a great example to set for other people around the world. So now that we've had all of our presenters go through, this is where things change a little bit. And we'll now open the floor for questions. Feel free to put the questions in the chat or if you're feeling um, rather engaging today, feel free, you can always unmute and um, ask yourself if you would like. Um, so since I don't necessarily see any questions just yet, um, I will start the ball rolling. And this is kind of a general question for everyone, um, but I know that um, Dr. Keskin, you mentioned, um, Bora, you mentioned some resources that were really helpful for you along your journey. Um, and it kind of made me think about a question I wanted to ask all of you. And that is throughout this journey, what are some resources that have been helpful to you that you would recommend other speech therapists or people with aphasia know about? Marina uh, wants to share. Yes. Okay. Aphasia recovery connection. I love That's it. It's been huge for us. And, you know, one thing I want to uh, make sure every, everybody knows is that you don't need to wait to get better in order to join, you know, a community like ARC. When we joined Marina, you could barely talk. And um, as Carol, that Richards will vouch, you're talking all the time now. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to wait. I agree. I think sometimes we think, oh, we're going to show up. And what if I can't talk like everyone else? Well, everyone else is dealing with this, you know, the same problem. So what better people to join with? Thank you. I love aphasia recovery connection. What about any other of our presenters? Do they have any good resources that they would recommend for speech pathologists to tell their clients with aphasia? I see Drew. I was gonna say, I swear to God, I was gonna raise my hand and um, uh, uh, aphasia recovery connection. Um, it's fantastic. Um, and also, uh, uh, um, for instance, in the Bay Area, it's a great programs, uh, aphasia uh, at, at Cal State East Bay, aphasia treatment program, um, uh, aphasia center of California. Um, there's just plenty of uh, them. Boston, Boston University. Fantastic. Thanks. Bro. I agree. As someone who is currently at an aphasia center, they are pretty awesome, aren't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I love it. I love it. Anybody else want to give a really good, we have a fate. Oh, Gary, Gary with the hand raised. Yeah, I wanted to talk a, just a little bit about technology because our, uh, uh, for many of us, our ability to deal around um, uh, aphasia, um, it, it, it's, it's important for us to use all kinds of things um, to be able to get so we can talk, even though you know we can't, even though we can't, we can't talk. And one of the things that I is I think is really important is that we need to help how to use all kinds of this 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 stuff so that we can use it better. So on that one. I, I love that. I think technology is so important in this day and age. It's never going away. If anything, it's just going to get more complicated. So why not use some of these awesome tools to support communication? I agree. I appreciate you bringing that up, Gary. I see we've got a couple hands raised. Woo. I don't even know who to go first. Tom, I'll let you go first. And then I'll do um, Denise, correct, from Just Ask. Wonderful. Yeah. I remember you from Aphasia Access. Sure. Um, and then I saw Judy and Jerry's hand up. So Tom, I'll let you go first. I recommend that, especially from my perspective with, with hospitals not knowing anything about aphasia, 
I think that all hospitals should provide the ABCs of aphasia to everybody who is discharged, given that those hospitals literally do not provide any information. And now you go home and you wait at home until you get a rehab opportunity. So uh, yes, I think that, right that what hospitals should be doing. And they should also include putting information on their website. Most agreed. We actually give your book out to all of our grad students when they're done, as well as our clients when they leave us from our intensive program. So we do very much love ABCs of aphasia. So I appreciate you, you I sharing that. Um, what about you, Miss Denise? Uh, I I would like for our SLPs or our discharge planning, give us more of the information and resources. Um, again, knowledge is power. So to know more about my aphasia or my family members to know what's going on, especially in the beginning where I, we have no clue what aphasia is and nobody provided us the resources. Like Tom says, we we gotta we gotta spread the knowledge to them to share so we know what's going on and do the best we can. We definitely have to do a better job. I agree. Okay, um, Jerry. Yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to say you're all amazing, but I wanted to spe specifically make a comment to Ryan Dreyer. Um, hi, Ryan. Uh, what you said that aphasia is not all of me really resonates with me and a lot of the folks in our group. And uh, I just wanted to share that, echo that. And also your comment, ask me if you don't understand or ask me if I don't understand. That's so important. It gives you the power. And also, and I was, this is a question for you, Ryan. Do you ever tell a person who's doing their best, would you mind just shutting up and let me talk? <laughs> You know, I don't need help unless I ask for it. Do you ever um, say, just give me a chance, just be patient? I don't know if you're on mute, but uh, I wonder if he you have any on thoughts mute, about maybe that. Maybe he'll unmute for us. You can speak now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to expect or, or, or love or anything. Um, I disconnected um, brilliantly because I I suffered, um, but I'm I'm local. I'm normal. I'm exactly um, divided, <laughs> but I I'm better and I I bloat <laughs> I love your laugh. And I just wanted to mention to, um, and then I'll shut up, to uh, uh, Gary Delgado. I'm sure you know about this, maybe not. There is, I believe, it's uh, a Black Americans with aphasia group. Yes. That is, uh, was started by Michael Obello Mia here in uh, North the Northeast, but I think it's under the auspices of the NAA. Are you, do you know about that group, Gary? Yeah, there, there yes. is a, there yes. is a place here as well that many many of us that that work with. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, so much for that. And I agree with everything you said. I just I even wrote down I was taking notes on everything, just things that hit me. And I wrote, "It's a symptom of me, but it's not all of me." It's really powerful words. So I we really appreciate that. Um, and then I think I had someone else with a hand up before I go to questions because they piled up in the chat. Um, let's see. I want to say it was Judy that had her hand up. Yes. Judy, what? there you are, Judy. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say one of the things that really, really helped me in the early, um, you know, it was it was after outpatient therapy. And I thought, oh, gosh, is this is this it, you know? Um, but the my my stroke of insight from Jill, um, I can I can I do do this this book. This was wonderful for me. She gave me the permission to take a nap in the afternoon, which I never realized I needed that. I just powered through. But she said you have to take that nap, 
and uh, to, you know, to reboot yourself. And, um, and then the other thing she said is that you can continue to get better because you are not told that initially. And um, it just gave me the hope, yes, I can still get better. I love it. Like Bora said, sleep 10 hours a day. <laughs> if it were up to me, I would take a nap every day. So take the nap. You are allowed. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you so much to all of our awesome presenters. We've got so many questions in the chat. So I'm going to go start up at the top. Okay. And this one is from Fabi in our audience. Um, she would love for Dr. Bora, if we could actually get your slides to share in aphasia center groups. So she has an aphasia center in Arizona. And she was wondering if she would be able to share your slides there. Of course. Yeah. And then same actually applies to all the presenters who have presentations. Um, is it all right if she and anyone else can get the information from you in order to share your story? Of course. And we have the handout too that should be up there. Wonderful. I think that's awesome idea to share with other friends because we have friends with aphasia at all of our centers that maybe not everyone is interconnected so they could learn and get to meet more people who are doing amazing and inspiring things. So thank you. Um, Jamie Lamb says aphasia recovery connection is amazing, which we all agree. Um, Carol from aphasia recovery connection has a question for Miss Marina. Marina, she wants to know, do you think it was helpful that your mom was also a speech therapist? No, because no, he makes me work. <laughs> because what? She makes me work. Uh, she makes that's that's kind of the problem with us speech therapists. Yep, live in SLP. <laughs> Twenty four. You work. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like our clients sometimes are like, thank goodness we can go home and get some rest, some of that sleep. <laughs> and Marina, your mom says, let's keep going. Yeah. What a good answer. Let's see. Ayla, can you hold up that sign again? She makes me work. We got to take pictures of this. <laughs> All right, I'll send it to you and you can send it to the folks. Wonderful, thank you. That's funny, that's great. When you when you were all talking about, you know, taking a nap, Marina was nudging me, see mom, see? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we just all drive ourselves so much to accomplish so much. And so the idea of a nap is almost counterproductive. Like we think, oh, that'll be, you know, lazy. When in reality, our brain needs that to keep rebuilding. and. Sometimes it's a hard concept to like make yourself take in. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. For the Stroke Smart Champions at scale, um, there is a plan for dissemination to the wider community. So, how do you plan to disseminate your slides and to whom? Well, let's see. Um, what I, we're, 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 focusing right now as i said on 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 the stroke support uh, on support groups uh in the in the area and we're doing senior centers so we've sent out an, an email asking them you know they're interested in it and also as um we decided to kind of go to the um low um wait a minute hold on let me let me, let me get it uh the low fruit help somebody help me with that <laughs> the you know the, 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 low, the fruit, so, so our, the people that we connected with you know so um so that's what we <laughs> that's that's where we're we're going we're going right now where um someone uh, brother is in a it has a dealership we'd like to 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 go there um uh, at somebody's church you know those those types of things and also uh, on Thursday, we hope, right, Lisa? 
<laughs> we hope to be on the news uh, locally. And uh, they, they, they spotlight us um, in, in doing this because they thought it was kind of neat that stroke survivors were actually doing this. So I think it's fabulous. That's wonderful. Yeah, so we hope, we, we hope to get, uh, uh, you know, people wanting us to come to them. But we also, we, lo we work too with, with um, the uh, Maryland stroke, the st um, stroke coordinators. Uh, in the ho in hospitals, they they know us about us as well. It's wonderful, and I I think it's much more powerful coming from someone who did survive a stroke. So, um, congrats on being hopefully famous, <laughs> and get to share uh, about aphasia on a bigger level. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Mora posted. Uh, Aphasia, National Aphasia Association, they can help if you're looking for a local community or a personalized aphasia program or provider near you. Um, they have a really nice directory where you can find different programs, whether it be aphasia centers, support groups, online programming. And I think that's really great to share. So thank you, Maura, for posting that in the chat for everyone. Mm -hmm. Denise said, I am me, not aphasia. I love it. Um, let's see. Looks like we've got some really good TED Talks and articles regarding um, some of our presenters. So like Black Aphasia Groups, um, TED Talk from My Stroke of Insight. And then it's also available, My Stroke of Insight is available in an audio recording read aloud by Jill, which is really awesome. Tom posted, thanks, Maura, and recommending about NAA as a very useful source. The fact that only three hospitals out of 418 have the NAA link anywhere on their website is beyond sad. I agree. Um, Ellen Bernstein Ellis said, so impressed by all of the presenters today. Their messages were impactful. Thank you. And I have to agree. We're not done yet, but I have to write that down. It's not a presentation without some key wording, right? Use, utilizing resources at its best. So thank you. Um, Maura posted, join the NAA Thursday evening at 7 p.m. for their Ask the Real Experts. Um, so we'll see many of these different aphasia heroes groups and panel members. So they'll also be doing some things. Gary, I see your hand up. All right, no problem. Okay. Just want to make yeah, sure. I that was hard. Can I say something now? Of Ruby? course, yes, please. Oh, oh, you're. Oh, sorry. So, one of the things that I that I think that um, we we've talked about depression and the the fact that we when I've read half of the people that we know are in that situation and. It's difficult to do anything around getting better for aphasia if we've got depression. And Thank so I'm, I'm curious about depression. how people do both of those kinds of things in order to be able to do work like this. All of us, you know, have, we all know that we have something of a, of a problem around aphasia but put it because of those things are are now to, to you know together it's 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 a i think it's a very difficult problem and i'm in i would i would like to hear what people think about that yeah um i i personally have a response but i would love to open the floor to our other presenters or even anyone in the audience who would like to offer something. So he's looking at with aphasia and you know mental health and depression. What are you guys doing to kind of combat that depression and mental health in order to move forward? And if and, oh, we got yes, yes, Denise. I was hoping you'd speak up. <laughs> ah, well. Our focus on our conference this year is mental health and um, hope. Um, 
we also have one of our presentation this Saturday is talking about how the neurological part of our brain um, causes some of that happening. And our doctors don't know if we don't tell them we're sad or we're, this has been really hard. Um, it's kind of like an ongoing grief process that we're struggling with. So um, my recommendation is make sure your professionals know how you're truly feeling and they can give you some techniques and tools, whether it's meds or exercises or see if some of the meds you are currently taking are actually a side effect of that. So there's a lot going on while our brains are damaged um, and how we can get better. So, but again, they can't help us unless we tell them. <laughs> I see you posted. Thank you so much. So you do a conference every Saturday on mental health and the importance of it for people with aphasia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and write your website right here for everyone. So it's www.justaskre.com. And I will, it's in the chat as well, but if you have any questions on mental health, I think it's great that you're hosting this weekly. Um, someone else put in, and it kind of goes along with what I was gonna say. Um, someone said, we need as speech pathologists to train our mental health counselors. Um, we talk about being a team and interdisciplinary. And that's actually, I think such a big part of our job is to educate other professionals on aphasia so we can all work together to better support you. So teaching mental health counselors supported communication and more about aphasia and what it is so that when someone with aphasia comes to them, they can get the help they need. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to expand upon that, but that's my thought. Let's see. We have so many good links in here. Um, Tom, you've posted some things about aphasia nation. Um, I also see um, Fabi wrote, many of our members have asked for mental health resources. We are in the process of reaching out to a local counseling psychology practice to see if we can partner with them to teach them about aphasia with the goal of referring our members to them for services. I think that's awesome, Fabi. Um, we recently hear, um, many of you guys know me, um, I've been on your screen enough. Um, and you guys know I'm part of Brooks Rehab Aphasia Center. We recently, um, our manager and speech pathologist Jody Morgan actually wrote a grant to get us um, a speech or a mental health counselor for all of Brooks. So we only have one, but they're housed at the Aphasia Center. Um, the first thing that they did was receive aphasia training and communication um, partner training from us. And so now we actually have someone in they rotate, he does group therapy sessions, but he also services individually. Um, it's such a really great opportunity and we're super, super lucky. Um, but in the past, we've also done reaching out to the community as well. And even if they don't stay in the community, they can go out and help other people in other places. Uh, Maura also said bridge projects are working on mental health with aphasia as well as many other groups. We will all try to coordinate and collaborate. And you know what, Maura, I think that's the biggest thing is we have to all work together because all of us together is so much stronger and efficient than all of us apart trying to do this on our own. So I appreciate you bringing up that as well. Um, and Roberta Elman said, it's very challenging to find mental health care providers right now post-pandemic. Caseloads are super full. I also agree with that, um, dealing with COVID and everything. I think we're all still trying to get kind of back to the new normal. Um, Ellen Bernstein Ellis, lots of support for the emotional journey of recovering from stroke and aphasia in Deborah Meyerson's book, Identity Theft, Rediscovering Ourselves After Stroke strokeonward.org and I agree that book is absolutely amazing it's I definitely recommend it Denise and she's going to be presenting on our last Saturday of the month so come and listen she's to presenting that. for us too 
So she's making the rounds, everyone, but I think it's so great. She's using her voice to support other people and to get the word out. So, and yours is open for if, so if anyone wants to go, they can come and listen to her. Yep, it's a free conference and um, if you register for it and um, you can't attend, we are going to try to record it and edit and put it on our website, so. Wonderful. Okay, let's see. I have to end with one more. And I think I want to end with a question for Marina. If that's okay. Yes. So we've talked about resources for other people with aphasia, but if you had to tell your speech pathologist one thing to make them, you know, even better, even though she's already the best, right? No. <laughs> what is something that all speech pathologists should know? Hmm. Ask me. Ask you what? Love it. What I want. Yes. Ask me what I want. You're giving me chills, Marina. Huh. Ask me what I want. And I think all of us. Oh, yes, ma'am, Miss Judy the emotional side of things, um, connect them with support groups at, or peer programs. It's, it is, it's one of the things that they're out there. There's so many speech therapists that, that actually don't, um, you know, make it a part of their um, uh, sessions, uh, but just really encourage people or connect them with somebody if there's not one around that they can talk to on the phone. It's the most important thing that happened to me is that first time I got to talk to somebody that had aphasia. I'll yeah. never ever forget it. And it's what put me on my journey of where I am. I love that. I think that's powerful. As speech therapists and any healthcare workers, our job, we have to look behind the mask and make sure we're addressing all your needs. And so I appreciate you giving that advice to us. I cannot believe this time went by so quickly, everyone. I feel like we should all just hang out even more. Well, I appreciate every single one of you so much. It was so amazing. Thank you um, again, Dr. Tom Brazard, Dr. Boric Peskin, um, Ryan Dreyer, Marina, Sasha, Tracy, Gary, Chelsea, Drew, Judy, all of you. It was absolutely fabulous. I have to say best brag and steal yet. Um, we are so looking forward on June 27th, same time, um, so two weeks from now at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we will have our second half of our Brag and Steel featuring even more of our friends with aphasia and their amazing presentations and words to us. Um, we hope that every single one of you can come join us and hear from them and just hear the words that they have to say. And again, let's have a great conversation like we did here today. Um, and I think that's it on our end. So everyone have a lovely Aphasia Awareness Month and we will see you at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye, Drew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dr. Bora.